Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, and hello, everyone. Welcome to the third session of the ITA webinars of 2021. Apologies for keeping you waiting for a couple of minutes there. Uh, we are just setting up some technical backend issues here, and which brings me actually to the next point. Uh, before I go any further in my presentation, I want to let you know um, that we have simultaneous translation that we're trying out. So hopefully everything is working and in order and we will have simultaneous translation for you on the interpretation at the bottom of your screen in Arabic, in French, in Spanish, in Russian. And of course, the original slides and the original presentation is in English. So we just had a few difficulties with the Spanish. Hopefully it's up and running. If it doesn't work right away, please feel free to um, switch back to English and then come back to Spanish. Uh, maybe we can show the next slide here. Let me see if I, there you go. So just in case, if you haven't found it yet, interpretation is at the bottom and those are your language selections. So, nous avons la traduction française. On a inspiré votre russe music. Tenemos traduction en español. Espero que está funcionando. And let me try this one. Yujad Terjama Arabia. So there you go. This is our logistics for today. Very complicated, but hopefully it is working for everyone very well. While everyone is settling into the rooms with simultaneous translation, feel free to chat with us, tell us where you're from in the chat function. And in the Q&A, if you want to ask questions as well, anytime throughout the presentation, we will answer them at the end of the presentation. And feel free to use the language of your choice. So if you prefer to ask questions or comment in a different language, the one that's available today, one of the languages available today, please uh, do so. So I think we're all set here on the technology side and that uh, should get us started. As you know, we have a uh, webinar series of one webinar a month for 2021. These are series that are open to the public and to anyone who wants to join. Here we tackle key anti-doping topics and uh, we go through anything from whistleblowing like today to science and medical testing. So legal side as well, different aspects of anti-doping that we cover. Of course, uh, we will have a survey at the end. So if you have any feedback or have any topics that you want covered, please let us know. I'll also add that this session is being recorded. Uh, we're not streaming live on Facebook today. Uh, so everyone is joining through Zoom and uh, we will have a recorded version of this webinar available on our uh, website and social media channels, uh, primarily on YouTube as well. So thanks to everyone who is writing. I can see comments popping up. So welcome again. And it's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, before we get into the topic, I want to introduce our presenting partner for the webinar program. And that is Informed Sport. So Informed Sport is a global certification program designed to ensure that sports supplements products are not contaminated with prohibited substances banned in sport. We're really happy to have informed sports support for these uh, series, which means that we can continue to develop content and to keep it free and accessible for all that want to join. All right, so let's get into it. Our topic for today is whistleblowing. We're taking a deep dive into the reporting of doping in sport. While whistleblowing is effective for exposing doping, little is known or understood about the actual process. Speaking up is a complex series of steps and decisions that may lead to career and life altering implications. To this day, majority of athletes feel like they have to choose between their careers and telling the truth. So helping us understand this very complex topic are three experts in the field of anti-doping. Each one of them will provide a unique perspective that explores different aspects of anti-doping. And I'm confident that you will find these presentations insightful and valuable. Whether you're an athlete or a coach or an administrator, or anyone working in sport, we hope that uh, you see value in this presentation today. So let me introduce our speakers and then we will hand it right over to Toby to do his presentations first. 
So Toby Atkins is a former professional cyclist with firsthand experience of whistleblowing in sport. Ever since stepping away from elite sport, he has been passionate about educating athletes around the world about whistleblowing and the responsibility they have to uphold values of sport. And maybe we can just put the previous slide back so we can see all the speakers and then we'll go over to Toby. Over the years, he has worked with Union Cycliste Internationale, the World Anti-Doping Agency, and the International Biathlon Union, and now with the ITA. With a focus on athlete education, and the development of educational structures that will allow athletes to compete in a safe and fair environment. So welcome, Toby. Two o'clock in the morning for you over in New Zealand. It is. It's an early morning or a late night. I'm not really sure what to call it, but uh, either way, we're here and we're good to go. So good to be yes, here. Yes, thanks for joining. Uh, we struggled a bit there in the, in, in the beginning, but everyone's online and we can hear you. So that's great news. All right. That's yeah, good to hear. <laughs> we'll come back to you in a second, Toby. I'll introduce Kelsey and Francois, and then we get going. So also with us today is Dr. Kelsey Erickson. Kelsey is the Executive Director of Athlete Health and Wellness at USA Cycling. Prior to taking on this role in 2019, she spent nearly a Well, yeah, you're muted again. My computers decided to mute me. I haven't touched anything. So uh, was I able to introduce you, Kelsey, at all? Or was I completely on mute? Yeah, you said prior to starting this role. <laughs> Thanks. It's just going so well today with our sessions, all kinds of complications. <laughs> so prior on to taking the role with USA Cycling, Kelsey spent nearly a decade of work in international anti-doping. Kelsey led and supported multiple global anti-doping research projects, focusing primarily on developing evidence-based anti-doping education interventions and whistleblowing policies and procedures. She was particularly interested in raising the athlete's voice and underlining the complexity of doping and whistleblowing in sports. So it is this unique background that paved the way for Kelsey to assume her current role at USA Cycling and to be with us here today. So welcome, Kelsey. Excellent. So I hope my computer doesn't mute myself for the last one, and then I'm done speaking and we hand it over to, to, to Toby. And finally, I would like to introduce Francois Marclay. Uh, Francois is the Intelligence and Investigations Manager at the International Testing Agency and is part of the newly formed cycling unit at our organization. Francois holds a PhD in Forensic Science and worked for the Swiss Laboratory for Doping Analysis for many years. During this time with the laboratory, he worked on the 2012 and 2014 Olympic Games before joining the 2015, in 2015, the Cycling Anti-Doping Foundation to build an intelligence and investigations team, which joined forces with the ITA as of January of this year. So uh, welcome, Francois. Thank you, Olia. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Good night, Toby. <laughs> We haven't decided if it's morning or, or nighttime for Toby, but regardless, uh, I will leave it now to Toby to share his personal story with us. So it's all yours. Awesome, thank you very much, Olya. Uh, Spencer, I don't think I can control the screen. So if you could uh, flick over to the next slide, that'd be greatly appreciated. Cool, one more, there we go. All right, guys, uh, well, I'm just gonna briefly introduce myself with a little bit of background, kind of who I am, what I do, that kind of thing. Um, so to start off with, yeah, my name's Toby. Uh, I'm originally British, but moved over to New Zealand when I was about 13 years old. So I'm about half and half, Kiwi, British, somewhere in between. Um, I wasn't, well, I am an ex-professional cyclist, having ridden uh, four teams across Italy, uh, UK, New Zealand, um, was pro professional for about four years. So 2014 to 2018. Um, and somewhere along that journey, I became a whistleblower. Uh, so that was about 2015. And that's what we're going to be exploring today. We're going to be talking about some of the ins and outs, what's that, what that's been like, uh, some of my perceptions and, and how it's kind of been throughout the, the whole journey. Really. Um, and then since, uh, since then, I've obviously done a little bit of work with, with WADA, so World Anti-Doping Agency, UCI, which is like the cycling, uh, kind of like the, the global representation for cycling, IBU, and now the ITA. Uh, and all of it's kind of to give a, an athlete's perspective on whistleblowing and uh, helping with the edu educational structures. So that's a little bit about me. 
Uh, but the reason we're here today is basically to talk about the story. So uh, next slide, please, Spencer. All right, so yeah, I uh, moved to New Zealand at the, the age of uh, 12 or 13. Um, and that was kind of when it all started for me. Uh, before that, I was like the fat kid that played far too many video games. Um, but it, it became pretty, pretty obvious early on that if I wanted to thrive in New Zealand, um, I kind of had to get into sport. And, and for me, that was swimming, triathlon, multi sport, that kind of thing. Um, but it was fairly obvious fairly early on that I was good at riding a bike, but I was pretty terrible at running, swimming, the rest of it. Uh, so rapidly kind of just kind of head to, headed towards cycling on its own, really. Um, and that's where it started for me. Well, the sports side of things started for me. Um, and I was never a hugely successful junior. I was always like top five and, and racing at national level events and that kind of thing. Um, always up there, but I was never, you know, never junior world champion or anything like that. Um, but it was clear from an early age that, that professional cycling was something, well, A, a dream, but B, something I'd really like to have a good crack at. Um, 18, obviously, uh, kind of turned elite. And, and that was where I suppose cycling got a lot more serious for me. I ended up joining an elite team. Um, I started university at the same time. And that was about the time where uh, all of a sudden I, I learned a lot about you know, the sponsorship side of sport and, and what being an elite athlete was, was truly about. Um, so the harder side of training, the dedication, the, the, you know, the lifestyle really changed at that point as well. Um, and, and that was just kind of solidifying the fact that this is, this is what I want to do. Um, and it was the first point where really the dream started to evolve into something that might be, might be possible for me. Um, and six months, six months after turning, turning 18, I got my first elite win. Um, and then fast forward a few years, I eventually uh, started searching for a professional contract over in Europe. Um, and for anyone that doesn't know cycling too much, cycling is, is very much based in Europe. All the big races are there, all of the big teams. Um, if you want to make a, a career out of it, that's where you kind of have to be. Um, so that's where I, uh, I started my search and, and that's where the team was based. So that was, it was Northern Italy. And that's, I suppose, where... Uh, my, my, my cycling journey and also my whistleblowing journey kind of started. Um, so next slide, please, Spencer. Cool. Um, so 2015, I, uh, I paused my university and I paused it to follow a dream. I think it's, it's something that a lot of sports people do is, is they, you know, the whole life is around following these dreams. Um, and for me, that's exactly what it was. The, the training became insane and I was, I was going so well at this time as well. It was, um, you know, if you've got a dream, you're willing to work so, so hard for it. It's, it's something that um, uh, anyone that works in sport knows well. Um, the drive is just is incredible. Um, and the thing is, with cycling being uh, it's a summer sport, and I was, I was based in New Zealand at the time, just before going across to Europe. Um, so I had a good, good summer block of training. <clears throat> and I knew if I could, I could get to Europe, um, they'd be in winter. And I'd be able to use my summer's training uh, to really kind of show what I could do. Um, so that's when I flew to preseason training camp in Sicily. Uh, and the weird thing was no one came to pick me up from the airport. It was, it was quite odd. Um, eventually, someone who didn't speak English collected me from the airport. Uh, it was someone that worked for the team. Um, but yeah, didn't speak English and, and brought me to a house uh, on top of a volcano in Sicily. Uh, with no address and, and no internet and looking about it now it really should like, ring alarm bells but but when you're a young athlete and, and you're starting to live your dream you're absolutely blindsided to everything that's around you because these things are just you, know, you, you see everything that's, that's so perfect so the amazing staff the riders the equipment the, the funding your, your dream is starting to come true around you and you're in total awe about what's um what's going on you don't, you don't see the, the obvious things right in front of you. <clears throat> so about after a, you know, a, long, a long week of, of training, things were going really well. Uh, and it was, it was time for, for performance testing, which uh, any athlete or any, anyone that works in sport knows performance testing is kind of like your chance to prove yourself to your teammates, to your, your, your staff, to your managers. Um, and often it's, it's a big part of selection for races or you know, for national teams or whatever it may be. Um, and for me, uh, I'm, well, I'm in cycling, I'm a sprinter. Um, I'm not light enough to be a climber. 
and I was brought onto the team to be, uh, I suppose, like a, a, a high level lead out man. So like uh, one of the, the fast guys on the flat roads. Um, and in that performance testing up the side of a mountain in Sicily, I beat every single one of our clients. Um, things were incredible. Like it just couldn't have gone any better. And it was clear as I was on for a really strong season. Um, something that even looking back now, it was just like you're kind of living on cloud nine. Um, and the day after that, I kind of I kind of woke up in this uh, this weird house in Sicily, uh, and I was absolutely broken. You know, you've just done a huge day of training after a big week, and you've you've done your testing, and you're 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 completely ruined. Uh, I needed a recovery day, and, and looking back, you know, any human kind of would. Uh, I can look back at my performance data, and it's the same uh, same thing. It's like there's no way anyone would be able to do that load and not need to recover afterwards. Um, but the thing was, half the team didn't didn't need to recover. It just seemed like every day they could come out and, and, and smash another huge training session. It seemed like they were just robots. And something wasn't quite right. So, uh, yeah, Spencer, next slide, please. So, um, after I cracked, this is kind of where my story starts, I suppose. Um, I was sitting around the breakfast table the next morning and I was an absolute shell of a human. I just, I was tired and, and half the team wasn't. And, uh, and that was when my, my team manager kind of sat next to me at the breakfast table and uh, he pushed a, a handful of performance enhancing drugs across the, across the table to me. He looked me directly in the eye and, um, and said, it's time to take your vitamins. And your whole world just falls down around you because in the space of five seconds, everything that you've worked for for five, 10 years just becomes not worthless, but everything falls down around you. Your whole career just becomes crap. What's just happened? There's, there's fear, there's anger, there's, there's, there's shame. Is, there sh is, is it shame because you don't, you know, maybe you're not good enough. Maybe this is something that you've got to, you know, you've, you've got to do. You're just not good enough without it. The self doubt. Um, and all these things still kind of haunt me, haunt me to this day, actually. It's, it's something that's it's very close to my heart. Um, anyway, I, I stuffed the, the drugs in my pocket and, and walked back to my room. And uh, the, the coach assumed that I'd, I'd taken them. Um, I stuffed the stuff in my pillow. Um, and throughout the day, I just spent the day kind of researching what on earth the stuff was. Um, and the thing was, we, we all hear stories about drugs in sport, whether you're an athlete, whether you're um, a coach or manager or whatever it may be, but there's just no way you can comprehend that it's ever going to happen to you. You just feel so detached from these things. Um, and when it does happen, you know, five years ago, we're talking now, we, you, it, it, it was a kind of a bit of a different world in the sense that we didn't really know. We didn't, as athletes, we weren't really sure where to turn in these kind of things. And the thing was, I wanted to do something about it, but I didn't know who or what or how or where. And you just don't know where to turn. Um, and that's kind of why we're talking about this stuff today. For me, it was the case of I wasn't going to let someone take my career away from me. Um, so I spoke to the only person I, I could really trust or, or knew in cycling. Um, and I accidentally became a whistleblower. Now, this is kind of the interesting part. It was... I'm, I guess I'm, I'm well known for speaking out and talking about my story across Italy, across the world now, but um, I didn't set out to be a whistleblower. It was a case of it kind of just came upon me and, and then I, I went with it because it was the right thing to do. But um, I, I have a good friend at the UCI and he's, uh, sorry, uh, British Cycling. And because he works for them, after talking to him about it, he had to report it to the UCI. So the UCI called me, they offered me a way out and, you know, a safe way out. And that was great. But they said there was nothing I could do. So everyone would just assume that I'd walk away from sport with no, you know, with no reason. Um, and the reason was that was because they couldn't do anything without evidence of wrongdoing. Um, and obviously in, in Italy where I was, um, it, doping is a criminal offense. And so they had to have evidence for that. So the next day I, uh, I went back to the, my team man at the breakfast table and uh, I quit the team. Um, and I slid the, the drugs back across the table to him and said, I know what they are. Uh, and then he promptly um, dragged me across the room and we went into the bathroom where he then locked the door and flushed all of the drugs down the toilet. 
to um, then say I passed the test. And this is like one of those things. It's like as a as a manager and athlete, they kind of hold you um, hold your career in the hands and and before you you, don't, you just don't know who to trust. Um, and and yeah, that's the hard thing for an athlete is a lot of the time, um, you know, you, your career and your well being is in the hands of others, and, and you do have to trust them. Um, but for me, yeah, like I said, I couldn't let someone ruin my career. Um, I chose to gather evidence, um, even though the UCI made it pretty clear that it was it was risky and it was my own my, yeah, at my own risk. Um, so the next day, I, I lied about a knee injury and and spent the the day searching the house after uh, the team obviously left for the day for training. Um, it took me all of about five minutes to find bags and bags and bags of drugs and equipment and vials and and everything else. Um, and so I took all the photos I needed. And then three days later, the uh, the team manager dropped me off at a bus stop, and I haven't seen them since, or, or at least I haven't seen them in person. Um, so next slide, please, Spencer. Cool. Um, so what happened next, I suppose, is is what we're kind of here to talk about at the end of the day. And uh, so I arrived home back in England this time. Um, I didn't hear from the UCI for months. I felt betrayed by cycling and I felt kind of like I'd lost everything. Um, the UCI is made out to be like a big monster in cycling. It's the, the big boss of everything. Um, I quit riding. Um, I was in a pretty bad place and, and with some pretty bad, bad trust issues. Um, but for sure, like, I think there's one thing, especially in this day and age, we know a lot about mental health, but this, this thing really does affect a lot of people's mental health. Um, but yeah, fast forward two months, I eventually got a phone call from exactly the same voice that called me in Sicily. Um, I recognized it straight away. And this time it said, Toby, there's, there's been a police raid and the team's been busted and they all tested positive. And all of a sudden, everything kind of became worth it for me. Um, it all made sense and someone was finally punished for you know, possibly ruining my career. Um, and it's easy to lose faith in something, especially when you're the thing being played. Um, but in this case, I knew there was, there was people in the corner of the athletes and, and that really kind of reinstalled my faith in, in the sport and within cycling. And um, yeah, that, that's something that it, it is really big to an athlete, I think. Um, and so what happened next, I suppose, is something that people like to ask me a lot. Um, but yeah, I did continue racing with different teams. Um, I did kind of continue in my career uh, before I did a call it quits on my own terms in 2018. Um, so yeah, I did, did continue after all of that as well. Um, and again, people ask me this all the time as well. Uh, what was it like? Uh, do you think it made me who I am today? Um, and within reason, yeah. I do think it shaped me, shaped me to who I am uh, and my career. Uh, but the more interesting thing for me is to uh, look at how did it actually impact me because that's where we can take away some learnings and, and maybe help other people in the same situation. Um, because at the end of the day, this is exactly why an athlete won't speak out because they feel like the impact on them is, is just too big or even they don't know the impact. Uh, and obviously I can't speak for everyone out there, but kind of this is where, this is what I think. Um, so short term, obviously it paused my career. There was, uh, there was about six months between me leaving and, and going back into professional cycling. Um, and through that time, there were some of the hardest kind of mental health times for me in my life. They were, um, yeah, it, it wasn't great. I had trust issues. Um, I just felt like a failure all the time. Um, and it was just a really, really rough time. Uh, it wasn't great. Uh, and obviously there was self doubts around that with just not being good enough. Uh, and that, that really kind of spills into all aspects of your life. Uh, and people don't quite realize that it doesn't just affect your sport. It's, it's your entire life. Uh, long-term, obviously like the understanding of what true, uh, sport truly stands for. And I think as an athlete, we're easily blindsided into like, it's about winning. It's about performance and all this, this stuff. Um, but for me, it's really taught me about what, what it stands for, like unity and, and you know, growing together. And it's, it's sport is, is just an incredible pedestal that we can really, really leverage and to, to make society good. Um, and that's something that's been, that's been really interesting to learn over time. Um, it made me into a passionate person that I am today. I've spent a lot of time talking about this kind of thing. Um, and over time, it's something that I've learned that yeah, you, you, you have to have people speak out about these things to, to really normalize it and to make it something that's, uh, that we can actually change. 
Um, and that's again spilled out into who I am as a person today. And, and that's that's something I really, really enjoy about my own personality, actually, is, is that I, I can be um, passionate about this, this kind of thing. Um, interesting one is I'm respected by other athletes and, and their entourages. And I was pretty sure back in the day when this this all went down um, that it wouldn't be the case. But I think looking back now, uh, I do have like the conversations I've had with with people. It, it's definitely something that, uh, that that has impacted, you know, positively. Um, and obviously, there's been opportunities both in and out of sport for me. So I've I've signed for teams and uh, based on being outspoken about this, and I've also had um, opportunities in in uh, outside of sport as well. Cool. Next slide, please, Spencer. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we're incredibly lucky to be involved in sport in this day and age. We're kind of at a point where equality and fairness now play a big of a part as performance. Um, and that's something we should be really proud of. But that by no means means that we're there yet. Um, there's still a huge amount of work to do. Um, so let's take a look at things. Interestingly, this is, this is a lot of the stuff that uh, Kelsey will be talking about just after me. Um, but yeah, it's interesting to see, it, I guess, from, from an athlete's perspective and then also um, from, from the other side as well. Um, so the things that have changed, I guess, in the past couple of days, or past couple of years even, um, education has just taken huge leaps and bounds, um, obviously with, with the likes of ITA and, uh, and WADA and stuff really up, upping the, the, the education side of things, the ability to speak out, um, the fact that I didn't really know where to go as an athlete was, is, is not good. <laughs> uh, it's now changed to the point where there's, there's three or four platforms I know off the top of my head that I could go and, and reach out with, which is awesome. Um, the stigma 10 years ago, we all would have been um, kind of looked down upon speaking out. There's for sure that's, that's not the case now. I know I can, I can talk freely about this stuff and uh, we're kind of respected for it, for speaking out for what, what we believe in and, and for clean sport. Uh, joint responsibility is a huge one. I think, yeah, again, 10 years ago, we'd be looking at like the athlete's responsibility and no one else's, whereas now it's a case of you've got athletes, coaches, um, administrators, the whole thing, it's, it's the responsibility of everyone. Um, and that's, that's something pretty special. Uh, and a big one for me is the anonymity. Um, the fact that athletes can now talk out or speak out without having to be, you know, known as, as the whistleblower or, um, the guy that, the, you know, the guy that spoke out, um, the fact that you can do it without everyone knowing is, is now a huge thing. But yeah, like I said, there's obviously a lot more work to do. Um, for sure, these things affect careers. Like those six months of my career that I lost straight away just because of, of how this panned out. Um, the perception of whistleblowers, like I said, it's good. We, we are making progress, but sure, there's a lot of, there's a long way to go yet. People are still like, you know, lose out on opportunities because of, of speaking out. Um, safety of athletes involved in doping as well. So that was one of the things that was, was made really clear to me was the fact that you know, if you're stuck somewhere and you're, you know, you're in a situation where doping is, is presented to you and you're kind of cut off in, in your own little sporting world, it's not safe to drop people in, you know, in these situations or speak out a lot of the time. So it's important to keep athletes you know, kind of safe in these situations. Uh, and the big one for me, which I know Kelsey's going to talk about as well today, is there's still no clear positive reason for an athlete to speak out other than their own kind of morals of like how they feel about it. Um, and I guess that's something we're all still working on, but that's kind of why we're here today, I guess, is, is speaking about these things. Um, but yeah, that's about it for me, guys. Um, I've tried to compress everything into about 15, 20 minutes. Um, obviously, it's a, it's, it's a quite a big story to get through. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the compressed version. So, oh yeah, I'll pass it back over to you. You did and good. Go <laughs> you did good on Thanks time, you know. <laughs> but <laughs> really, on a serious note, thank you so much for sharing your story with us. We know that you've spoken about it many times already, but the fact uh, that you are willing to share it with us, and I know it's not an easy thing to speak about, uh, we really do truly appreciate um, you taking the time and and the energy to really deliver this message because like you said, it doesn't get uh, spoken about enough. And I feel like, um, Kelsey, you're probably nodding your head as much as I was listening to Toby because in your years of work in anti-doping research and research on whistleblowing, you've heard many stories that are very similar, aren't they? Yeah, absolutely. 
I think for me, and, and I'll come on to this in my slides, but what Toby's experience really highlights is this is a really complex issue and it's not a short term, you know, you, you report and then you move on with your life. Uh, there's so many things involved in the lead up in the moment and in the follow up. And I think that's a space where we still have a lot of work to do, which Toby highlighted. Yeah, so let's talk about that now. We'll we'll hand over the slides to you to continue okay. the presentation and to talk about the social science research aspect of yeah. it. And we'll also watch a few videos that I think even the words were so similar to what Toby has expressed as well. So let's go ahead. Awesome. So thank you very much. And first of all, thank you, Toby, for sharing your story. I think it's hugely powerful to speak to from experience to the complexity of this issue. And so just to give kind of as Toby did a little bit of background on me and, and why I'm even here to talk about this. Um, as was mentioned, I spent almost a decade working in international anti-doping and I was particularly, well, towards the end of that phase, particularly focused on the issue of whistleblowing on doping. Um, you know, it's become a, a topic that's being addressed more and more within the sport, recognized as a really effective way to expose and address doping in the sport. But as always, I think it's one of those things that as humans, we want to see as black and white. Uh, and it's not, as Toby's story highlighted, it's not always as black and white as we want it to be. And therefore we need to take some time to consider like, how do we best facilitate this? And so one of the things that came out of my initial research, and there's really not been a lot of research, um, there hasn't been a lot of research in this space. And one of the things that I looked at early on was, you know, just a simple question of, do athletes feel comfortable speaking up? Like, would, would they report doping? And what came out of that initial research was an indication of the fact that whistleblowing presented a true moral dilemma. And what that is, is two equally valid and demanding moral options. So essentially, once an athlete or anyone becomes aware of doping, they have a decision to make. And it's not necessarily as straightforward as we want to believe. Um, because on the one hand, they can report the doping, and that's what we ask them to do and expect them to do. And that then ensures clean sport for other athletes. But on the other hand, they are likely thinking about, do I potentially want to protect that athlete? You know, I don't know the, necessarily know the whole story. I don't know what's going on. Do I want to be the one that is the reason their career is ended, likely, by reporting? And so it's not necessarily as simple a decision. And another thing to keep in mind, as Toby's story highlighted, is once you know about doping, you can't unknow it. So this isn't, this isn't a situation rarely, or maybe every once in a blue moon, but rarely does someone go into a situation looking to try and find someone doping. It's more often than not like a situation like Toby's where completely out of the blue, you find yourself in a situation where you now know that doping is happening. And either because it's been offered to you or it's directly in front of you, or you've witnessed it in someone else. And so I think that's another thing that we have to keep in mind is this isn't really a, usually a choice. You don't choose to become involved in a doping situation where you have the opportunity to, re to report it. It's usually you find yourself in that situation and now you can't not be in that situation. So regardless of whether you choose to report or not, there's going to be consequences and you're always going to be involved. Um, so I think that's another thing to keep in mind. So we'll start there with very early on in the research. And I believe this was, uh, we published it in 2017, but we identified, you know, that there is this true moral dilemma facing potential whistleblowers. And so it's not necessarily quite as straightforward as you see doping or witness doping and you immediately report. So we'll go from there to this kind of served as the initial foundation of wanting to look into this issue further. And I'm just trying to change the screen real quick. We'll get there eventually. Oh, there we go. Okay, so that served as kind of the initial starting point of, okay, so whistleblowing on doping isn't necessarily as black and white as we would like to think it is, which is pretty much true of everything in life. And so we wanted to look into this issue further. 
So we then uh, launched a five phase research project that was funded by WADA. And we started with just auditing what whistleblowing best practice looks like. And at the time, it didn't really exist in sport. Uh, but whistleblowing is not new. It's not limited to sport. And so we looked at other industries and we looked specifically at finance. Uh, and we hired a company to do an audit of whistleblowing best practices in the financial industry to see if there was a way that we could potentially replicate that in sport. And then we audited existing whistleblowing platforms. And as Toby mentioned, uh, you know, five years ago, there weren't that many. 10 years ago, I don't even know if there were any. Uh, in the last few years, we've seen a significant increase in the number of platforms where individuals can report doping. Um, but we wanted to get a sense of not just identifying where they are and, and what they are, but you know, what do they include? Things like, you know, do they have multiple channels for whistleblowing? Do they accept multiple languages? Are they only available to specific sports, et cetera? So really just kind of getting a landscape of what whistleblowing platforms are out there so that we could hopefully identify, you know, what would best practice look like? We then interviewed coaches, athletes, and actual whistleblowers uh, to gather their views and experiences of whistleblowing. And then we conducted a survey, which was the first whistleblowing survey uh, at the time of coaches and athletes across multiple countries. And then we used all of the data that we had gathered to create best practice guidelines for WADA. And that report is now published in online um, on WADA's website and a number of other places. So I won't go into total depth on it, but one of the things that came out of this, um, oh, cool, now it's changing itself. Uh, one of the, no, this is great, you can stay. Um, one of the things that came out of it was identifying with, and this has already been touched on in the opening lines and was very much spoken to in Toby's experience is this isn't just a process of report it and stop. Once someone knows about doping, you don't just simply go and report it and your life moves on, but there's a lot more involved. And that was something that we really wanted to uh, help people understand because if you don't understand that, you can't provide the best services possible um, to potential whistleblowers. So next slide, please. Perfect. So what we identified was that whistleblowing is really a process. And in its most simplified version, it involves three steps. And I think Toby's story really highlights this. Um, you know, first you have to determine that what you saw was actually doping or could be doping. And, and we're gonna watch a video or some clips of a video um, that speak to this and the, and the video is based on this research. But, you know, this was something that I think people really underestimate. Like you think it's super obvious, you know, you see doping, you know it's doping and you report it, but reality is that it's not usually that simple. And even and Toby talked about how like, you know, he obviously had some questions and it fell off, but he then had to go do a little research and make sure he actually knew what was being handed to him. And that's true in many situations. So let's watch the first clip um, of this first step. And just to kind of give some context to the video, the video is based on the research and it's using real actors uh, to share the stories of the experiences. And the research is based on the cumulative experiences of three actual doping whistleblowers. So we combine their three stories into one um, to help protect their identities and to really highlight um, a lot of the similarities across their experiences. So what you're gonna view now is a a video of those experiences that is done by actual actors that we hired. Step one as a whistleblower is actually coming to terms with what you saw or experienced. It seems like a really simple thing to do, but it took me, others I know, months to actually come to terms with Oh yeah, that was shitty. You know, that broke some rules, or most likely broke some rules. Looking back now, there was a lot of earlier signs. A lot of small things that just kept adding up. And I literally would have never put it down to that. Most of the times, it's not I saw some guy injecting testosterone. He has the picture and video of it. He has everything. It's not black and white like that. 
And I think acknowledging that is really important. Step one is coming to terms with the fact of what you saw was wrong. So yeah, it, in real life, it's not staggered. But um, so th what's interesting and what's important to point out about this is the words that they're speaking are directly the words from the individuals involved in the research. So we didn't um, tailor any of it. These are literally the things that were said by individuals who actually had blown the whistle on doping. They broke it down into, well, not all of them, but many broke it down into these steps, whether they explicitly called it a step or not differed. But, um, you know, I think this is an important, there's important implications of step one for us as practitioners and those that are looking to facilitate whistleblowing is this points out the need for education. Uh, you know, if we're trying to figure out we're trying to encourage people to blow the whistle on doping. We need to make sure that they know what doping is. And, I, and I'm now, as has been mentioned, working at USA Cycling. I've talked to our elite athletes. And if you ask them, not, not all of them, but in general, you know, do you know how many anti-doping rule violations there are? The majority of them won't know that answer. So if we want people to be speaking out about doping, our first step is to make sure that they actually know what doping is uh, and that they know that they can report it without having all the evidence. That's another big piece of this. Uh, and then the second part being, as Toby mentioned, that they know where to go. Um, so that speaks to step two. And the next step is determining where and what to report. And um, just as a caveat, if the video doesn't work, uh, it's online as well, so I can share that link with you. Uh, so you can watch that. I'll try it, and if it doesn't work, we won't spend too much time on it. Yeah, so we let can. me know if you see it. Okay. Does it seem to be working? Nope. <laughs> All right. Let's just go to the slides. It's fine. Sure. Let's keep it simple today because the technology is giving us some curveballs, so throwing us some curveballs. And so we'll share, share the, video, the video on the comments to make sure that everybody can watch it. Okay, so step one, as we mentioned, is determining that what you witnessed or experienced was doping or likely doping. And then you have to make the decision to report it and then actually take the action. Um, and part of taking the action is knowing where to report it. And one of the things that we're seeing is that we've gone from having limited places to report doping to potentially having almost too many. Um, and one of the things that's important for us practitioners and as those working in the sport is making sure that we make it as simple as possible for someone to report. Because the last thing that they want to have to deal with if and when they identify doping is now having to figure out what do I do with that? We wanna make sure that they have an automatic place and platform to turn to and that's on us to make sure that they know that. So one example I, I use of, to kind of highlight how complicated this can be is, let's say you're a you know track and field athlete competing at an event in, I, I don't know, let's say Austria, and you witness doping. Who do you report to? Do you report to the Austrian anti-doping agency? And let's say you're an American athlete. Do you report to the US anti-doping agency? Do you report to US track and field? Do you report to WADA? There's a lot of different options and none of them are necessarily wrong or right. But as an athlete, I wanna know exactly where to go. Uh, and so we wanna make sure that we're minimizing um, any barriers to reporting. And then once you've made the decision and you decide how to take action and that you're going to, you then have to deal with the fallout of that. And as Toby mentioned, it's not as simple as you report and then move on with your life. Uh, you will likely need to provide further follow-up information. Uh, you need to process what has happened and you need to, to deal with potential implications for your career. There can be a lot of emotional and mental and even physical implications from reporting. And there's no timeline for when that ends. So as Toby mentioned also, he's still, you know, his life is still impacted by the fact that he chose to report doping. And thankfully, many of those impacts are positive, but no doubt there still can be negative implications long-term. And so that's another thing we need to consider as we're encouraging people to whistleblow is 
is what um, care and provisions are we providing after the fact and are those long-term? So ultimately, if we want to facilitate whistleblowing and doping, we need to create and foster a culture where people are able to speak out. So they've got the tools and resources and knowledge and they have confidence that their concerns will be listened to and acted upon. And that's a really key one is, you know, if we are able to get people to report, we need to make sure that we're giving them reason to believe that reporting was worth it because we're taking action based off of that report that we've received. So if we go to the next slide, um, I just want to kind of highlight some of the key implications that came from our research of some of the ways that athletes and coaching coaches suggested that they would be more likely to report. So if we want to enable whistleblowing on doping, as mentioned by Toby and already by myself, we need to educate them on how to do that. Where are the platforms? What type of information do they need? Do they have to have all the evidence? No, they just need to report it. It's up to us to investigate. So making sure that they understand that. Uh, also, another thing that would help is providing whistleblower advocates. So in the US, we have, um, we have ombudsmen for a lot of things with athletes and an ombudsman is essentially someone that guides an athlete and advocates for their rights. Uh, that would be something that would help with whistleblowing uh, on doping. And maybe that could be someone like Toby who's actually had experience blowing the whistle on doping. And now they become a point of contact and someone that can support an athlete who's considering whistleblowing. So that's something to consider. Uh, and then we need to communicate and promote successful stories of whistleblowing. And by successful, you know, I think Toby's is a perfect example of that. He reported something, action was taken based on that report and a change, a positive change was made in the sport. So successful would be essentially any time that a report has led to an action. And then finally sustained, ooh, there's a typo there, my bad. Sustained and person-centered engagement with whistleblowers. So it's not just we take their report, we say thank you and we move on, but we're actually providing long-term continuous support. And whether that's directly from the organization that's receiving the report, or it's we have you know, this support system available that's separate from us and we're connecting that individual with support. That's a really important piece of this because the implications as Toby highlighted and as I've heard from many other whistleblowers are long-term and they want to know that they have continued support and someone to turn to because you never know when you're gonna need that. So next slide. Um, one of the, when we were presenting our findings to WADA and, and have presented them further, really we, we turned to the COMBI model, um, which breaks down behavior as being needing to address capability, motivation and opportunity. So if we want an individual to be equipped and able to blow the whistle on doping, then we need to make sure that they have the capability to do it, they have the motivation to do it, and they have the opportunity to do it. So if we go to the next slide, there's going to be a lot of words on here, so don't panic. Um, this report is available online and you can go look at it there. But I do want to just kind of highlight some of the things that came through in the research, again, with elite athletes and coaches. So capability address, addresses both the physical capabilities, so skills, strength, and stamina, and it also refers, refers to psychological capability, so things like knowledge and skills. So what came through in the research is that often coaches and athletes were unaware of whistleblowing safeguards, so protections that are in place for them, things like anonymity, which was mentioned um, by Toby, the fact that they don't have to you know, raise their hand and put their name to the report, but that they can be protected in that. Uh, there was also a lack of understanding about what information should be reported. So again, do I have to have all the evidence or is it okay to just report suspicions? And we should be encouraging them to report, report suspicions because you never know when the information you, might, you have might be the last piece of a puzzle that's already being put together by an organization. And the majority were not aware of WADA's whistleblower program. So that is the protections and um, you know, the actual essential contract that you sign that allows you protections. And they were uncertain about what whistleblowing even means or involves. 
They were also concerned about jumping to conclusions that could essentially end someone's career. Um, and so I think that's another piece to highlight is that it's important to know that as a, a potential whistleblower, you're not reporting something and then we just automatically take action on it. There's investigations that go on and, and it's up to the organization to do that. So those are just a few of the capability pieces. Um, the next is opportunity and that's both physical and social. So they have the physical resources and platforms to report and they have the social support of those around them to provide opportunity because they feel like they'll be supported in that. So in general, they didn't feel encouraged to whistleblow by their sport. Uh, and I think that's a big piece to, to keep in mind um, and something that you know is changing, which is great, but we wanna make sure that we're creating a culture where whistleblowing is not just accepted, but it's encouraged and celebrated. They were also often unaware of others that have reported. So they didn't know other people like Toby. Um, you know, that other people are reporting and, and that's in another important piece. And so we talked to WADA about advertising on their webpage. How many reports do you get a year? You don't need to name the people, but it's important to see that others are doing this um, and so that you, you're you not alone in it. And then the reaction to whistleblowers is really important. We need to make sure that we're celebrating this as this is something that's courageous and encouraged and we want to be celebrating those that have the courage to speak up against doping so that others feel empowered to do it. And then there was also, and Toby spoke to this, concern about negative implications for their career. So making sure that you know, people aren't being punished for having the courage to report and putting safeguards into, into place to prevent that. And then also considering potential financial implications and whether that's through the loss of a contract or a sponsorship or a career, um, those are things that we need to be considering and making sure that we're putting protections in place. So the final uh, of the three is motivation and that's both reflective, so self-conscious planning and evaluation, or it could be automatic. So the wants, needs, desires, and impulses of an individual. So when we talk about motivation, Coaches and athletes generally did feel that it was their responsibility to report doping, which is great. They feel like they have a personal responsibility to do it. And they generally intended to report, which is great. Um, and that came out of our whistleblowing survey. However, a concern is that they didn't generally feel encouraged to whistleblow. So, you know, they have a desire, they feel responsible, but they don't feel supported and encouraged by those around them. And that's has implications for all of us involved in the sport. So that's something that we need to take seriously and consider, you know, what, what are the messages that we're sending both implicitly and explicitly, and are they encouraging whistleblowing? And hopefully they are, and if not, we need to change that. They're also not sure about who's trustworthy. You know, Toby mentioned in his experience, he turned to someone that he trusted, and that's a really important piece individuals need to have places and people that they trust that they can go to because it, in a lot of ways, they feel like they're handing over control of their life to somebody else. And naturally they want that to be someone that they trust. And another concern is they're not sure that doping tips, tips are acted upon. So what happens once I report, is it even worth it? And that's a place where as organizations and as um, federations, you can be advertising you know, actions that are taken or you know, maybe it's something where we consider putting like a little asterisk next to an anti-doping rule violation announcement saying, you know, this, this resulted in part at least thanks to tips we received. You don't need to identify the person, you don't need to identify how that information was received, but it gives some motivation to, okay, action actually happens based on reports. Uh, another thing and not surprising, they're more likely to report if they know their identity will be protected super important. Um, there's anxiety associated with whistleblowing as met, was mentioned by Toby. And that again, importantly, doesn't end as soon as you report that anxiety can remain. And so what are we doing to address and relieve that? And um, they're hesitant towards taking responsibility for ending someone's career. And I think as humans, we can probably all uh, relate to that and appreciate that. So making sure that, you know, we're we're providing guidance and support and also about the process of, you know, an anti-doping rule violation of it's not 
you report and we sanction. But there's there's due diligence and investigations that go into this. Uh, and then again, as I mentioned early on, becoming aware of doping is emotionally draining, regardless of the, the decision that the individual makes about what to do with that information. Once you know, you can't unknow. Uh, and so that's something that I think as people in the sport industry, we really need to appreciate uh, and take into consideration of, you know, this, this is something that once you know, you don't ever unknow, regardless of what choice you make on what to do with that information. And so we need to make sure that we're putting systems in place um, that provide a level of comfort and trust uh, and continued support when people do have the courage to report um, potential doping information. So I appreciate that that's a lot of information and this report is over a hundred pages, I'm pretty sure. Um, but you know, going back to the video that, that we weren't able to share, I'll, I'll send out, we can send out the link to that, but I, you know, our goal in making that video was really um, to translate research into something that's really easy and tangible to understand and digest. And really, uh, you know, one of the things you noticed even in the short couple minutes of it was that there were a number of different actors involved and that was intentional um, because any one of us could be or could become a doping whistleblower. There's not you know, one person or one sport or one country where this is most likely to happen. We could all find ourselves in that situation. Um, and so it's really important that we prepare everyone through education, through information, and to be able to take action if and when they find themselves in that situation and that we have and structures and systems in place to provide ongoing support to them. So uh, I would encourage you to check that out and just really, if nothing else, so that it helps you appreciate situations and people like Toby um, who have found themselves in these situations, you know, kind of un unwillingly or unintentionally, um, but have had the courage to, to take action and um, to protect clean sport. And then how do we make sure that we're continually supporting them in that? So I think that's it for me. Thank you, Kelsey. While we weren't able to see the video, we always share the slides after the presentation with the attendees. So you will get both the video and the slides. But to your point, Kelsey, it's a, a matter of us all playing our small role, uh, sharing this information. So if you're a coach, perhaps it's worth sitting down with your team and just watching the video together or forwarding this, this, uh, the slides or the video to members of your sport community. Uh, so it's these little actions that will make a difference. Um, it's these webinars or these discussions that will make a difference. But it also, of course, it's not just about each and every one of us. It's more of an institutional effort to make sure that we are making the right changes as WADA, as the ITA, or as any other stakeholder in the system. So. I think that ties in nicely into the presentation that Francois has prepared for us on reveal and just on the global anti-doping system, how all of this ties in together. So mm -hmm. Francois, I'll hand it over to you and you let me know if you want me to change the slides or if you are <laughs> good to take it because we never know today. <laughs> yes, thank you, Olia. Thank you for the, the IT support. <laughs> um, well, we're incredibly grateful for, for uh, Toby and all the sources and what they do for, for the sport and also Kelsey and other researchers because they give us so much guidance and without them, we would not do our job the way we do it and we would not get better at it. So today, if you could jump to the next slide, Olia, please. Thank you. Uh, maybe you can click twice already. So we have the full picture one more time, maybe. That's it. Thank you. So if you look at the athlete, he's just one piece of the puzzle, really. Um, yes, an athlete may dope all by himself or herself and sold the products over the internet or and use said products without, without any guidance. But nevertheless, the athlete is at the center of a spider web. And more often than not, the products are sourced from um, someone in the entourage, uh, let's say a friend, family member, a teammate, or some staff, uh, like a coach, a doctor, et cetera. And the athlete could get guidance on how to use the products or get the products administered by a doctor or a medical personnel outside of the team setup. So there are all these persons gravitating around the athlete that can facilitate, if not enable doping. And if you look beyond the spider web, 
then the products first need to be produced, of course. They need to be manufactured. They need to be transported from the to the consumer. And since nothing comes for free in this world, then they are sold to the uh, to the athlete. Um, so our focus is not only on the athletes, but on the bigger picture of doping. And information from uh, sources is invalu invaluable in that respect for us. Oh, yeah, if you can jump on to the next one, please. So if you look at the WADA code, then you will see exactly that. You will see that anti-doping rule violations, they do cover the bigger picture. And that's why intelligence and investigation units at anti-doping organizations that exist for that very reason. Particularly if you're looking at rule violations that have nothing to do with simply the use of products. But if you look at the possession, the distribution, the trafficking, etc. These problems can only be addressed or, or almost exclusively addressed by uh, intelligence and investigation activities. Olyask, if you could please jump on to the next one. Thank you. Okay, so, but to conduct intelligence work, we first need to collect and process information and we need to transform information into actionable intelligence that we can use, that can serve a purpose, that tells a story, that paints a picture. And one thing we could do with the intelligence is to do some testing, for instance. And um, the information can come from a variety of sources, from open sources, such as the, the sports media, but also closed sources. And confidential human sources are one of the most valuable, if not the most valuable source of information for us. The sport is huge and t doping organizations cannot have all eyes on every athlete, on every athlete support person and every competition throughout the world 365 days a year. So we truly believe that the athletes, the athlete support person, then basically anyone else interested in the sport or affiliated to the sport in any capacity could help us uh, keeping sport real. Uh, so therefore we believe that we're all in this together. The voice of the community is very, very important to us. And we're actually listening to absolutely everyone, regardless of who you are, where you come from, uh, what language you speak, what you may have to report, and how much you may have to report. Uh, we truly will come with open arms any potential source. And what we want to do from the get-go is to build a trust relationship. People who are reporting to us, they're reporting to a system, uh, they, but we are humans, we're not robots. And there is, it's a human talking to another human. And you also have to, to, to show the sources that's, that, that's exactly the setup there. Uh, it's not a non-off process. You come report, you go, and then some robot is going to process information, and then you will never hear about it any, any, anymore. No, it's, uh, it's all about the trust, and we need to build the trust as soon as possible after someone reports to us. We need to, to show them that, that we care, that what they do is good for us and good for the sport, and that we consider uh, consider them. I think Kelsey talked about it before, or briefly, confidentiality is paramount to us and the well-being of our sources or main concern, I would say, or first concern. We do not disclose any personal information related to the source to anyone without their prior consent. And we definitely want to avoid exposing or putting at risk any source. Uh, so when we sh have to share information, because let's say the ITA cannot deal with the information because we can't do tests or the, the athlete is under the jurisdiction per se of another uh, federation, uh, of an international federation we don't work with or under the jurisdiction of a NADO, etc., then we will have to share the information. We will always search for the consent of the, of the source first, and we will always sanitize the information, always remove every uh, personal data and everything that could allow the source to be identified. This is the, the, the best thing we can do to protect the sources. And that's where really, uh, that could really, uh, that, that plays a huge role in, in the well being of the source. And as explained by Toby, as explained by Kelsey, the mental process of reporting to anti doping authorities is complex. It's, uh, it's a more dilemma. It's very real. I've been talking to dozens and dozens of whistleblowers over the years. It is difficult. Uh, and we want to avoid any further traumatic experience. Uh, we acknowledge that people come from different uh, places and cultures. 
that they come forward for different reasons and understand and consider also the sensitivity of their personal situations because more often than not we see people reporting to us that are putting them themselves at, at risk and i'm not just saying getting kicked out of the sport and saying you know things that are, are pretty nasty so you want to avoid that at all costs so that is also why at the ata the sources and i mean source handling is handled by experts by experts professionals in in uh, in this field and we launched reveal um at the beginning of the year, Reveal is the ITA's online platform to report potential anti-doping rule violations in a secure, confidential, and anonymous manner would the source prefer that. And I think it's outlined here um, on this line, and I will show you also a quick demo afterwards of, uh, of the system. Any source that reports to us can, oh, if you can just go back, that's that will be my last slide. Thank you, Ilya. <laughs> Any source, can open a mailbox uh, for further exchanges with the ITA and they may decide to remain anonymous at all times. So you could simply, that's a chat box basically, and you don't have to provide your contact details, you don't have to provide your name, you don't have to provide your email address, but you can still remain in contact with the ITA if you want to, first, uh, to exchange further information. And I will try to take over from there and uh, give you a quick demo. So let me click around. Uh, that should work. While Francois is loading the presentation, the demo, uh, just a reminder, if you have any questions for the panelists, please put them in the Q&A. We have a few that came in, so we're going to address those shortly. But do feel free, take this opportunity to ask your questions. Uh, we will have about 15 minutes or 10 minutes to uh, address those. OK, thank you. Uh, I'm trying to share my screen, but it doesn't allow me to. Uh, wait a second. Great. So let me jump there real quick. Okay. So can you see the, the website? Yes. Okay. Excellent. So if you're going to reveal the sport, this is where you will land. That's the, the, the homepage of the, uh, the reveal platform. You have a few options here. Well, of course you have the general explanation of what the platform is and what you can do on the platform and then you have a series of buttons here first you have a button that will uh, open a pop-up window uh, in a different window for you to type in the information you want to report you have the secure mailbox that's the chat box i talked about before if you want to keep talking to the ita keep exchanging information with us there is a button that's going to explain what can be reported and then there are two other very important buttons as well. That's the whistleblowing policy. And I will give you a, a quick overview afterwards and the privacy policy that has to do with data privacy. The system today is available only in English and French, but over the next few months is going to be translated into different uh, languages. But regardless of the language of the homepage, people can report to us in any language really. Uh, so it's open for absolutely everyone, like I said before. If we click on reports, it's going to take a, a short while. My connection is not the best. This is where you're going to land. Um, there are only two questions in the form that are mandatory. It's the sport and, of course, uh, providing information. Um, you can decide, you can indicate, sorry, what type of information you want to report is it about uh, the administration of a product is it about the trafficking of a product is it about a suspicious behavior suspicious performance etc or you could always also click on other because you're not a, exactly sure or maybe it's about multiple problems that you want to report then you will be given the choice to indicate the sport and it's a a complete list of all the global association of uh, international sports federation so it's very comprehensive you've got a lot of choices here so you can let's say uh, choose uh, biathlon you want to report on biathlon you want to report that someone is uh, trafficking products then you can indicate if it's related to a specific event um, that's going to be in relation let's say to the Be uh, beijing olympics that are taking place next year uh, 
the issue we're talking about is taking place in, I'm going to pick randomly, in Belarus. Uh, also details about the location, the traffic, you know, I have no idea. So I'm not going to, to put anything in there because I don't know where the, the trafficking is taking place really. I know about it, but I don't know where it's taking place. It's taking place, there is no specific period. It's year long. People are, are trafficking every month of the year in during the season, outside of the season, makes no difference. Who is involved? I couldn't type in the, the name of, of the person who is involved. Uh, and I could also indicate that that person is a coach. Uh, then we ask also the source to let us know if they have reported to the, the information to someone else before. And when I mean someone else, I mean another organization. They could have been to WADA. Like Kelsey said, they could have been to WADA. They could have been to the national, the International Federation. They could have been to the NADO of the country where that's taking place. They could have been to the NADO where of their own country. They, have, they could have been to several uh, different organizations and it's always better for us to know because we may move uh, different stones uh, at different organizations and it's always better to centralize the, the handling of one source and the handling of the information. So if in that case, let's say that the, uh, the source did not report to anyone else before and what's, what's the problem about? Well, Mr. Smith uh, is dealing steroids and that's it, let's say. Once that's done, you can also record a sound clip if you want to do it. Uh, it's always better. I mean, it, it, if you'll go on your mobile phone, the web page is going to, to look exactly the same. Uh, it's been optimized also for, for mobile phones. And of course, the, the option to record a sound clip is very convenient on the mobile phone. You can also attach files, you could take pictures. It's all possible. You could drop in documents, anything in your procession that you think is um, relevant for the authorities and that you would like to share, you can do it. Then you will be asked about uh, your personal details, which you don't have to provide. As you can see, it's not mandatory. There is no asterisk. If you want to type in your name, fine. If you want to give a phone number, but not your name, that's also fine. If you want to just to give your email address or none of the above and stay anonymous, you can do it. Uh, you have full control as a source over what you want to be known about yourself or not known. Then this is a famous chat box I talked about before. Um, let's say you just want to report one time and disappear. You can untick the secure mailbox uh, button and agree with the whistleblowing policy, agree with the privacy policy and submit the report. On the other end, you could open the mailbox there you set up a password, uh, a personal password that you have to type twice, of course, and then you can send. You will be getting, if I just give it a quick try, you will be given uh, a case ID. Of course, you need to make sure you're not a bot. There you go. It's going to transfer the data and it's going to assign a case ID to the report. Here it is. If you want to carry on talking with the ITA using the same device and the same web browser, then you don't have to remember your case ID. You just go back to the platform, you click over here on Secure Mailbox, and you jump right in, and you can uh, keep talking to us. If you were to use uh, a different device, a different web browser, then you would have to log in and you would have to remember your case ID as well as your password, of course. And then th that's it, you know. Um, and if you go back to home and click on the whistleblower policy, well, I don't know it. I don't know it. And you're gonna get here. You can read through and it's going to cover all the aspects uh, related to blowing the whistle, what type of information you can report to us and how the information is going to be processed, what we're going to do of it, uh, what you can expect, uh, what we can do in terms of transfer of information, how it's going to be done. Uh, then we're going to cover aspects related to confidentiality, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm not going to go over the whole thing, 
but the whistleblowing policy uh, has been um, created by the ITA with the legal department, the compliance department. It's been done by, by experts in the field. So it's very solid. And same goes for the privacy policy that you will find clicking by clicking on the other button here, here, and you will end up here. And that's about data privacy, uh, ISPPI, um, and all those regulations that are in relation to uh, data privacy. So everything is accessible to the source. Uh, so there is no smoke screen here. The source has access to everything. They know what we do with the information. They know how we, we do it. And very importantly, they know what we're not going to do with the information. So that's very important to point out that their roles and responsibilities for the source, but also and first and foremost for the source handler. So that's about it for the demo of uh, the review platform. And I will just go back to the presentation if you don't mind. So you can take over control, Olia and jump on to the last slide, please. Sure, give me one second to put it up, or Spencer is, excellent. All good there. Fantastic. So I just wanted to give you a quick example of how a small piece of information can, can prove extremely valuable. So a couple of years ago, we had a writer. He's at the bottom of the, of the small figure on the left side. He reached out to us and said, look, there is someone out there who is offering doping. He went through a friend of mine and told that friend of mine to tell me that he was offering to dope. Okay. At that time, the source was not willing to share the name of the potential supplier of products. Didn't want to, didn't know about uh, the products and their names and the doping protocols whatsoever. Didn't want to share the name uh, or put us in contact with the intermediate, with the friend. So we had extremely little information, and but we jumped right in. And like I said, show that we're not robust, show that we are human, that we're caring, that we know uh, the complexity of reporting and uh, that the person was potentially putting herself at risk if it was mishandled. Uh, so we clarified all that and uh, we built the relationship and day after day we got more. We got the name of the supplier, we got the name of the products, we got the name of athletes that person is working with, we got the name of the intermediate, we were able to uh, talk with the intermediate, etc. And in a matter of two or three weeks, it moved from the picture you've got on the left to the figure you've got on the right. And that person uh, you see at the center of the figure has been connected to so many other issues and he's the, the tipping points of all of many, many problems. And with that small thing, piece of information, we got to, uh, to uncover many, many doping issues. And athletes tested positive in relation to that network. Uh, athlete support person also were identified and were sanctioned, et cetera, et cetera. So even for a so sources that think they, what they have is worth nothing or it's too little for us to be interested. They're completely wrong. With your small piece of the puzzle, then it could just be you know, the, the, the solution to our problem. So we truly welcome any sort of information. And in any case, we don't ask them to run the investigation for us. They're bringing something to the table. It doesn't matter if it's not complete, if it's a small piece, if they don't have evidence. They're bringing something and then it's for us to do the work and to do the rest and take it from there. So that's about it. Thank you, Francois. And thanks for the demo as well. I think it's very strange for a lot of people because they're not exposed directly to seeing how the platforms work. So it was very important to show for us. We only have a few minutes, uh, but I do want to take a question from Nita and either Kelsey, Francois, Toby, feel free to jump in for this question before we wrap up. Um, so Nita is saying, thank you for such an insightful session. And the question is, I'm a physiotherapist and a first year student of the Erasmus Master Program in Sport and Integrity and Ethics. My question is related to the difficult positions sport medical professionals are put in by the anti-doping policy. Whenever an athlete asks them for medical advice about a prohibited substance they've used, whether accidentally or non-accidentally. The medical professionals have on one hand the professional duty to keep this information confidential and on the other hand according to the anti-doping policy they have a duty to report slash not comply. So what should be done about this? 
It's a very good question. I'm not sure who wants to take it, Kelsey or Francois. <laughs> Kelsey is pointing at me. Thank you so it's much. It's a hard one. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it's a hard one, and and the moral dilemma sits not just with the well, well sits with any source, and we're, we're talking about a medical practitioner and any medical practitioner, anyone, like I said, could be a potential source. The particularity in that context is that uh, I think they're bound to, I don't know how it's called in English, but some sort of secrecy law or something related to the medical field. Yes, exactly. So I think they, they can't legally. Uh, they can if they want, but then they're going to commit uh, a, a violation themselves of their own sets of rules in their own uh, professional field. So it's for them to balance what's best in their interest first and in the interest of the cause, I would say. So there is no right or wrong. It's for them to decide. But of, on our end, we don't want to encourage people to breach rules, other sets of rules, not just anti-doping rules, to uh, come forward with evidence or information. Just like we would not ask a source to commit a crime to obtain evidence, you know, uh, if we know there is evidence out there, we will find a creative way to find it ourselves, legitimately, legally, and we're not going to ask people to to commit a crime or breach a rule uh, to get the information that we need. Thank you. And it's a difficult question to answer. So, Nita, if we didn't answer your question fully, um, I should put the, the contact information on the screen so you can email us at educationita.sport. We do get follow-up questions quite frequently, so please don't hesitate. Also, if you are not comfortable to ask a question today uh, live during the webinar, you can always reach out to us. I saw that Toby and Kelsey even put their personal email addresses or professional email addresses in the chat as well. So we really appreciate you uh, giving uh, the opportunity to the attendees to contact you. So thank you for that. And thank you, of course, for the presentation, uh, for bearing with us as we navigated some challenges today, but nevertheless, we were able to cover a very, very important topic. So we will be back again. We're here once a month, still online during this time of a global pandemic. So uh, next month, we will discuss supplements. We'll share the date um, of the webinar with you. It's going to be at the end of April. In the meantime, uh, please stay in touch with us. Please feel free to email us as well. Um, you can go on the social media channels to look out for the new date. And just a quick follow up before we wrap up to Mauricio, who's asking about the results of the report. I'm assuming referring to Kelsey's once again, we will send you the all the materials for today links to the report and links to the video. And uh, we've also updated our website. So don't hesitate to go to it.sport to check it out. So those are my final plugs for today. Thank you once again uh, to all the attendees, to all the panelists, to all the translators for delivering the session with us. And I wish you a good night, good morning, good afternoon, and thanks again. See you next time. <laughs>